I don't see wa hands waving around, so I'm, I'm going to bring you to the privacy question. Yeah. And I'll read this uh, passage from, from your recent um, um, piece about taking the internet seriously. Life streams will make it even easier than it is today for software to learn the details of your life and predict your future actions. We've heard a little bit of that in the context of this conference already. The potential damage to privacy is too large and important a problem to discuss here. Briefly, the question is whether the crushing blows to privacy from many sources over the last few decades will make us crumple and surrender or fight harder to protect what remains. Now that, I just have to ask you about that. You know, there are two, there are two issues, a small issue and a large one, one having to do with live streams per se and the threat to privacy there and in, and in similar type systems. And the broader issue of how we deal with privacy in, in the world today. Um, uh, it is true that any system that, that is hanging on the user's every move, particularly insofar as it's a historical system with archives, um, and in particularly insofar as it has software to make projections, and that can be very sophisticated, um, is going to know your next move in a lot of cases. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's v that's very valuable knowledge in a lot of cases. And a system anticipating what I can do, what I will do, what I will want to do, um, uh, caching technology, you know, what piece of information should be where. In, in a sense, all of, all of the operating systems are built on, on good guesses about, about the user's next action. Um, when we were working on um, adaptive parallel computing, um, also some time ago, the idea being that you had a lot of uh, desktop machines which were not used most of the time. And in a place like a university where there are large compute jobs, uh, you'd just as soon be able to use those idle machines right. by having a parallel job. I mean, this has been around in, in different ways. And, it was, and we found it was very easy to, to take a desktop machine and notice that the owner of this desktop machine never did any work after 4 o'clock on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, where he never got in before 10.30 in the morning or something like that, or he always left on Friday at Just, just for purposes of, the, of, of machine usage, we're talking about. Yeah, just yeah. for purposes of machine usage. And, um, and so this was perfectly innocent, you know, so, so the system w would just happen to know that you were likely to be out and could therefore plan on using your machine. But uh, as we started thinking about these files, and as, and as those who were participating in the experiment who had kindly lent us their machines started to say, wait a minute, how did you know that? Or, um, I'm not so sure that I want... Anyway, they, legit, <laughs> legitimate, legitimate issues were raised, and especially when, when you think of adding an AI inferencing component on top of that. Yeah, what exactly are you doing on Thursday afternoon? Yeah, or a camera that's observing the, the user. Yeah, it, yeah, or a camera, yeah, right. You can go a long way with that. <laughs> um, the broader issue to do with privacy, um, we see many younger people, or at least uh, the idea exists, and I'm not sure it's true. Certainly at Yale and at other places when, where, where one deals with students and you know, next generation users, whatever you want to call them, that um, younger people are privacy damaged in the sense that they, they grow up um, without developing a normal sense of privacy. Uh, they are told, as soon as they're able, you know, articulate or literate, whatever, that spy satellites are photographing them all the time, which is true, that their machines are storing all sorts of information, that the websites are accumulating information about them, stashing it on their own machines. There are cameras all over the place photographing them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, I, I think especially the, the, the spy satellite issue counts more in people's minds, in younger people's minds, because it's completely beyond anybody's control. I, I need one of our Intel students to react to that, so be ready, okay? Um, uh, st students see it, rightly, as, as utterly untouchable. It's just going to be there. It's a fixture. It's, and for that matter, they like it insofar as they have um, sat-nav and, you know, uh, right. Thing, right. things like that. But, um, but they grow up without being accustomed to say, this is mine, this is my life, and I will admit you to it as I see fit. You have no right to know beyond what I choose to tell you. Um, now, there's, there's been some 
interesting recent indications that maybe, that's, maybe, maybe we are attributing too much complacency, too much passivity to younger people. You know, there are these studies about people fussing around with their Facebook accounts and do they really care about the privacy settings, and evidently they do, and they try and reconfigure them, usually in vain, to provide, you know, give themselves a certain amount of protection. I think, we, I think we're certainly going to see um, next generation social networking tools that um, rather than being sort of um, uh, based on the, on the out of control exponential tidal wave, everybody sees what I'm doing model, I'm going to start with a, a limited circle of my friends or roommates or my family or our group or, you know, our lab group or whatever, and then and add people in a much more limited way um, because people definitely have a feeling with current generation tools that the momentum is all with people who don't care. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a peer pressure issue to some extent. The momentum is with those who don't care about privacy, but, there are, but I think maybe privacy is an innate desire. I mean, privacy is a luxury. We haven't always been able to afford it. Today, we can afford a lot more than we're getting. And I hope to see software tools evolve in a way that provides privacy, at least as an option, mm -hmm. if you do care. Um, let's take another question, this gentleman here. I'm glad you... Um, can you please identify Yeah, Larry yourself? Weber. Hi. Um, I'm glad you brought up that category. I have a daughter that uh, made fun of me the other night when I said I was going online. And I said, "Why you're making fun of me. And she said, well, you use the word online. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the question that you brought up there with the social technologies and where we're headed here is what companies do you see that exist today, major companies, especially ones that have advanced in the internet, are really responding to social technologies and being thoughtful about you know uh, embracing a new generation and also us, the older generation, about how we're going to interact with one another. Um, I, I guess almost every company is 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 aware of and thoughtful about social networking, and privacy um, being an issue uh, about which social networking companies are getting batted over the head a lot. They're all aware of it, and and they're good. You know, there's smart people at all these places. We tend to see these questions from the biased perspective of our own tools. We meaning me, and not a universal law. Um, we've thought of uh, privacy um, in terms of a live stream community. The way we ran the system, we began with a small number of people. We were dealing with maybe a lab group of 20 people. 25 people. We, uh, we had our own streams, but then we, uh, we, they were all subsets of a master stream, and I decided which items on my stream were public um, and, and which were private, so that the lab group as an institution had its own stream. Um, we did this commercially, commercially at a small company also. Um, everybody had his own stream, and also the development group had its set of streams and so forth, you know, building up. A community was defined by those who had access to a stream. And um, access was never assumed, but um, we, could, uh, we could make the life of an institution flow through the cybersphere by making it flow through a stream in which we controlled access, in which the owner of an object controlled access, and which the community itself was well defined. Okay, so this is, uh, this is for the Department of Computer Science at University X and, and nobody else except if we all agree. Was there, um, was there a provision for anonymity? That was an issue that came up uh, last night. Eric Schmidt made the point that, that he thought one of the worst mistakes in the way, mistakes, one of the worst emergent mistakes in the way that the, that the internet and the web have evolved was, was, was that anonymity was, was too great of an option, um, that it was possible to, to do too much without, without accountability. I think that's true. It's certainly um, the idea of anonymous posts or information distribution certainly runs counter to everything we know about how human beings have communicated, how scholarly and scientific communities have run. 
been run, at the very least, you put your name to what you say, and if you're not willing to do that, um, we're interested in the reasons why, I guess. Um, it, it's uh, something like um, an issue that we saw in the, um, in the early years of, of our developing streams when the question beca became, history was, history was accumulating on the stream, can you go back and rewrite history? So something happened three weeks ago, and here's the stream element saying that, you know, we had a meeting and blah, 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 whatever. Can I go back and, and, and change it, or can I copy it in the future, or something like that? Um, the answer is probably no, um, and, and, and probably anonymity is... Um, um, anonymity part of um, a superficial culture of junk information, which is too too willing to uh, not distinguish the sources of information, not distinguish edited from non-edited English, not distinguish well-sourced from unsourced mm -hmm. information. Um, it's all part of a, a, a complex of, uh, do we take the time, do we take the time to figure out whether the facts we're throwing at each other are true? <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, this is an extra added layer in postmodernist thought. You don't necessarily need to think about it <laughs> at all. But um, anonymity is a problem. Worrying. I agree. Back here. Hi, uh, Eli Pariser. Um, just drawing on that, I mean, I've been thinking about this uh, Nietzsche quote recently, which is, uh, man can't live without forgetting. So what, is this, what does live streaming do to our relationship to our history? I mean, when, when when we can remember every single moment, how does that change you know, who we think we are and how we operate going forward? And to what extent is that like, are we getting trapped by that or is it liberating? What's, what's the deal? <laughs> um, I'm not sure Nietzsche would be a live stream user. That's a, <laughs> uh, you know. You don't think Nietzsche never, would tweet? I mean, he yeah, does tweet. I don't think he would. A lot of aphorisms. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. And the origin of tweeting, after all. <laughs> um, th there's, there's a bit, uh, um, what you say is interesting. There's a big difference between a memory and a memory queue. I mean, what we can, what, what we can store on live streams or any other kind of streams, any kind of historical stream or narrative stream, chronology stream, is um, just as we can't store history, I mean, we can store raw material of history, history has to be made in people's minds. Similarly, the texture of a memory is, is a radically different proposition from anything that I can put in a live stream or any kind of stream. Um, so I, I, I don't think, just because I have, um, in effect, uh, a highly comprehensive diary. I mean, the art of diary keeping, journal keeping, uh, certain um, um, elements of society used to do this routinely. Um, it's the uh, origin of all sorts of interesting literature, just as they used to write letters to each other. And um, uh, I, I, I think the, I think we're returning uh, to an older world rather than inventing a new one, an older world in which people took the trouble and the time to document their own lives more carefully. Not everybody had the luxury to do that, but many people did. Many literate people assumed that, it was, that they were going to spend several hours a day in correspondence and a certain amount of time updating their journals, their diaries, their appointment books, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, so, uh, so it can always be a potential embarrassment and potentially more than that when you have information, when you are unable to expunge information, when you can't control your own past. But um, you ought to be able to control your own past. But beyond that, you ought to, I think many people will, will live with and I think benefit from uh, a, a more complete record of what their lives have been like without intruding too much on a Nietzschean uh, brain implosion. Okay, over here, uh, Steve Levy.